When did globalization become a feature of human societies? And what did it mean to different people across the globe? In this part of the course I will suggest some answers to these questions. Definitions generally present globalization as the gradual integration of economies, of peoples and of cultures across the globe. Although contacts between Asian, African and European continents had existed before, historians contend that global interactions became increasingly common from 1500 and rapidly intensified after 1800. So this period of about 300 years has been called early or proto-globalization. The history of early globalization has traditionally been told as a story of discovery and empire. According to this narrative, the emergence of intercontinental networks followed from the overseas ambitions of the Spanish and Portuguese monarchies in the late 15th century. These Iberian states were attracted by the potential riches of oceanic exploits and started to sponsor exploratory expeditions that crossed the Atlantic, the Indian Ocean and eventually the Pacific. Christopher Columbus's arrival in what's now part of the Bahamas in 1492 is just one example. Through trade, diplomacy and military aggression, both Spain and Portugal were able to expand their influence in the following decades. As this map shows, by 1550, Spain's seaborne empire included large parts of present-day Cuba, Mexico and South America, as well as the Philippine Islands in East Asia. Portuguese interest largely centered on trading posts in what's now India, Sri Lanka, Indonesia and China, as well as the eastern coast of Brazil. But this situation did not last for long. Economic, political and religious rivalry in Europe encouraged the English and the Dutch to penetrate the Spanish-Portuguese maritime empires. Through chartered companies, they developed a global trading network of their own in the early 17th century. As a result of these various enterprises, European, Asian and American societies became increasingly entangled. By 1650 one could buy Spanish books on the local market of Lima and purchase Indonesian spices on the streets of Amsterdam. In China, factory workers started to produce porcelain for a market of European buyers. And yet, attractively straightforward as this story of global commercial expansion may be, I think it's also a deceptive one. More specifically, its European perspective blurs our understanding of developments in Asia, in Africa and in the Americas. For example, the Spanish conquests of large parts of South America can only be explained by internal rivalries among native regimes, such as the once powerful Inca and Aztec kingdoms. In addition, it is important to emphasize that the position of European traders in many parts of Asia was conditioned by the policies of local elites. Mughal India, Ming China and the Ottoman Empire represented powerful states with sophisticated economic infrastructures of their own. So clearly, Europeans were not the only empire builders of their age. Hence today, most scholars prefer to study early globalization from different local perspectives and in terms of mutual exchange, encounter and interaction. What these different approaches have in common is that they are interested in the extent and the impact of increasing globalization. For example, through new commercial networks, large-scale migrations, biological exchanges and the transfer of knowledge. Let me examine some examples from each continent. In the Americas, the arrivals of Europeans in the 16th century had unexpected yet disastrous demographic consequences. Because the native population was not resistant to European epidemic diseases, such as smallpox, thousands of men and women died. Estimates suggest that in some areas of Mesoamerica, the population fell by 90%. 
This Colombian exchange also involved the transfer of animal stocks and plant crops, which altered ecological structures in the Americas forever. The establishment of plantations for the production of sugar, for coffee and tobacco, led to an increasing demand for human laborers too. And these were largely found across the Atlantic. Throughout the 17th and the 18th centuries, plantation economies relied on a system of forced labor and coerced migration. Several million Africans became victim of this transatlantic slave trade. In Asia, by contrast, the impact of early globalization seemed more limited. As said, the empires of China, of Japan and Mughal India only allowed Europeans to enter on their terms. Local populations showed little interest in European products, but benefited from the growing inter-Asian trade, which brought textiles and silver from India to Japan. Only in a few cases, European powers were able to assert their political authority. For example, in the Moluccas, Dutch and English trading companies sought to establish a monopoly on the lucrative trade in spices through means of military aggression. The increasing movement of people, of products and ideas also affected cultural practices and religious beliefs. Catholic missionaries gradually turned large parts of the Americas into Christian societies, and global Christianity was often adapted to suit local demands. This Japanese statue of the Virgin Mary and her child Jesus typically integrated Buddhist models and indigenous taste. European societies too changed as a result of the encounter with foreign worlds. The growing supply of sugar, coffee and tobacco from American plantations altered food habits and urban lifestyles, exemplified by the growing number of coffee houses in the streets of London, Paris and Berlin. Luxury products from Asia, such as lacquerware, porcelain and textile, transformed material culture and taste be it in the, the French royal palace of Versailles, to the kitchen equipment of a common Dutch household. Yet the globalization of people, of products and of knowledge also challenged traditional European worldviews, which were generally based on classical and biblical authority. It eventually forced Europeans to rethink the very foundations of their society, culture and religion.